The fourth beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Uh, in reading that text, um, one of the things I want to share this morning is that there are occasions in preaching where I'll give away the sermon right at the beginning, and I'm going to do that today. And I'm going to make an invitation to you at the, at the beginning that I normally would make at the end, uh, but I'm going to do it at the beginning so that when I wander around in the weeds too much today, you'll at least know what I'm talking about uh, as we move through. Another translation for uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled, are happy are those whose passion for justice and truth as expressed in their relationship with God and Jesus Christ will be lived out in their lives. Now that's a short explanation for what the text means, and I'll get deeper in that as we move through it today. I'm going to invite you to join with me as we pray together. Let's pray. Oh Lord, I pray today that the words that I speak in the meditations we each have in our hearts and in our lives will be acceptable in thy sight, you who art our strength and our redeemer. Amen. When I was ordained here in 1974, uh, right here at the altar of this church, uh, my ordination as a deacon, then we had a two-step ordination process, no longer the case now, but I'm both an ordained deacon and an ordained elder in the church. But in that first ordination, Bishop Paul Galloway was here as a guest bishop preaching the service. Uh, we had a bishop who had died and Bishop Copeland had died and Bishop Galloway was here. Well, Bishop Galloway was an old fashioned kind of bishop. I mean, really old-fashioned kind of bishop. Uh, he was in his 80s, I think, when he preached that service, and I think he forgot what was in our ordination vows. Once upon a time, in Methodist pastor ordination vows, we took a vow of temperance. Some of you may remember from the 19th through the 20th century that prohibition itself was instituted by the Women's Temperance Union, whose primary membership was in the Methodist Church. Some of you may not have known that. It was our fault, prohibition was, um, that that happened. Uh, we did it uh, to the world. And I, uh, I will not say that we led the way in repeal of that amendment, but nonetheless, uh, we started it. And Bishop Galloway forgot that that vow of temperance had even been removed from uh, Methodist pastor's ordination vows. And he said that to us as we sat there, all of us young pastors, in stunned silence at what he was asking us uh, uh, during those vows. Many things have changed over the years, not the least of which is that vow that uh, Methodist pastors once took and no longer take, but also the actual language applied in the discipline to the communion elements that we use now. You all know that we use what? Help me here. Grave juice in our communion. Well, a number of, uh, of uh, general conferences ago, two annual general conferences I go out and think, the language that was once used about communion elements was changed. Once upon a time, we as Methodist pastors were instructed that we were to use the unfermented juice of the grape for communion elements. Okay? That got dropped. Okay? So now Methodist churches can use the fermented juice of the grape or else wine, if you will, although I know of no Methodist churches that do that. Well, one or two, okay? But still, nonetheless, that happens. Some of you may even know that Welch's grape juice, Mr. Welch was a solid Methodist lay person in Chicago and instituted Welch's grape juice in order for churches to have a, a, a safe way to serve grape juice for communion elements. That's how Welch's grape juice got started. So next time you go by Welch's grape juice, think, well, well, once upon a time, Mr. Welch did that. So churches could uh, drink uh, in, in communion elements that unfermented juice of the grape. Now, I say that to ask you all a basic kind of questions. What are you, what are you passionate about in your life? Okay. What are your passions? Well, you know, I, I, I think about my own life and what I'm passionate about. And I know when I wake up at two o'clock every morning, the first thing that I do, not on purpose do I wake up at two o'clock in the morning, sign of my age. When I wake up at two o'clock in the morning, first thing I do is I walk to the door and make sure that everybody who's supposed to be there is there, okay? Y'all ever done that in your lives? You want to make sure that uh, the, the kids that are supposed to be there are all there. The cars are kind of lined up in front, one of the passions that I have. But the second thing I do is flip on my computer and look to see if the Astros won. That very, uh, normally I go to sleep before they're finished, okay? But that's the thing I do is look to see if the Astros won. Well, it indicates to you something about my current 
passions about things is that the safety of those that I love and Houston baseball, those, those are my existing passions. I've never quite understood, however, the passions that some of you have as venophiles, those who are deeply committed to the drinking of wine in life. Not because I failed to take that vow long ago when it was stated to me by Bishop Galloway, but I've just been very curious about that over the years. A number of years ago, a friend of mine, he's got these two friends of ours, we travel together periodically. We have another trip coming up uh, this fall uh, where we're going to the national parks uh, in the Midwest to Yellowstone. Uh, I've never been to Mount Rushmore. I'm kind of looking forward to all that. We're gonna do some hiking to Glacier National Park. I mean, those things we're gonna to do together. We've already done a Civil War trip. We've done a Revolutionary War trip. And a couple of years ago, we did uh, all of the desert national parks and visited reservations across uh, the desert Southwest. Great trip, by the way, if you wanna do that. And one of the people who go on that trip, uh, one of the two other guys that go on that trip is a man here uh, who is originally from Houston, now moved to Wyoming, uh, originally here from Houston, who owned a software company and then sold it for over $100 million. Well, he doesn't lack for funds in his life, as you can well imagine, after he sold that. Very humble guy. You wouldn't know that when you, if you ever met him, but uh, he's done, he did really well when he sold that software company. We were in Aspen a number of years ago uh, at the Aspen Institute, uh, uh, and um, we were eating uh, supper one night, um, the, several uh, of us were eating supper, and he ordered a bottle of wine. Not unusual for this group of guys. Uh, he ordered a bottle of wine. Now, I will tell you, I'm not a drinker, so I really have never developed a taste for wine, regardless of the vows I didn't take, okay? Never developed a taste for it, and, but they ordered a, a bottle of wine for the table, okay? Now they also had uh, wine at the house and it was yellowtail. Some of you who are cheapies know about yellowtail um, and know what that's like. Okay? Uh, although I wouldn't know what it tastes like, but nonetheless, they, they knew what that tasted like. And he ordered a bottle of wine and I made the mistake of looking at the wine list about how much it cost. The bottle of wine was $800. And when I saw the price, you gasped, I gasped louder than that, let me tell you. <laughs> I'll say, help us Jesus here uh, with, with that kind of cost of a bottle of wine. And so me, being the mischievous type that I often can be, challenged these guys to tell me the difference when we got back to the house of a glass of $800 a bottle of wine and a glass of $399 yellowtail wine, okay? And I said, don't give me any of this stuff about bouquet. I want to know what it tastes like, okay, when you, when you, when you drink it. And they dared me to take a sip, so I did. It just tasted like vinegar to me, the $800 bottle of wine. Um, didn't have nearly enough sugar in it. I told them on the spot, I'd rather have a glass of Coca-Cola, thank you, uh, instead of this. But they were passionate about that wine. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? The kind of passions that accompany people's lives. I've taught in a number of places around the world to pastors, and particularly in developing countries, the standard meal which you feed pastors, and you always, I always bought them a meal because they didn't have the funds often to do this, was always chicken and rice. And when you go to a developing country, I promise you, if you eat like they eat, you'll eat chicken and rice and maybe beans for a little protein. Now the chickens are nothing like the chickens we buy. You know, the big old white meat breasts that we buy that are too big to cook, okay? and too tough when you get through with them. Well, their chickens don't look like that, I promise you. They were backyard kind of chickens. And um, uh, mostly you got a lot of bone, a little bit of skin, and very little meat on top of that. But I always ordered these huge bowls of rice. Okay? And they would heap rice up on their plates, deep, deep on their plates. And eat that rice like it was candy, like it was the Hershey bar. Uh, that they ate. And then, if there was any left over, which there often was not, they would wrap rice up in paper napkins and take it home to feed it to their families. That was always an interesting thing to me. Most of us just push food away or throw it away. They would cart home rice to feed their families. In Oliver Twist, um, some of you read that over the years, Charles Dickens' wonderful book about poor boys in London. There's a scene that stands out to me. 
Oliver Twist says, please, sir, to Bumble, who is the supervisor, please, sir, I want some more at a meal that they were eating. Bumble couldn't believe that he was being asked for more food, and he said, what do you want? Quietly, Oliver Twist says, please, I want some more, and holds out his plate. Hunger and thirst make people really bold in life and aggressive, desperate and reckless like Dickens' poorhouse lad, Oliver Twist. You also know that hunger and thirst can change the course of history. Whole nations have moved to escape famine and drought. Wars have been fought in our common history and humanity over the shortage of bread. Wars have been lost by the lack of water. You remember the story of Esau in the Old Testament? If I remember that story of Esau, who sold his birthright for what? A bowl of scripture describes it as pottage. He sells what is rightfully his. He is so hungry for a bowl of soup. Hunger and thirst, some of the strongest nouns that we use in the English language. And they're even stronger verbs when used that way. The reason I think is simple. Homer said it all in Achilles' words. Now I think Achilles says there are no riches compared with being alive. The passion for food and water to being alive is one of the greatest of all. Now I want you to remember that intense drive as we talk together this morning because it's helpful in understanding this line of Jesus that we know is the fourth beatitude. Holy, happy, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness in life. The verbs used here are the strongest that can be used for human desire. They're even words that are at the core of the physical life of the people in Scripture. Numbers says it this way, as Israel wanders in the desert complaining about Moses' leadership. And the people spoke against God and Moses, it says in Numbers, saying, there is no food and water out in the desert. There's a linguistic strength and an emotional power in using these words, particularly when it's applied to bodily sustenance, to feeding our hunger and thirst. Now, one other thing I want to say about those words. Hunger and thirst described here is of an intensity that's not easy to explain or to translate from Greek to English. Matthew 5, 6 is constructed, put together in a way that assigns the most pressing desire one can have, a consummate appetite for those who hunger and thirst. The structures of the Greek sentence can't be translated exactly right because there's a peculiar combination of prepositions that are in that Greek phrase. But a sense of it is expressed, and I'm trying to express it as strongly as I can this morning. Hunger and thirst describes in the fourth beatitude a desire not for part, but for the whole thing. Not for just a little bit, but for everything that one can get. For instance, a hungry woman can ask for a slice of bread or a piece of bread, but what's implied in the beatitude is that she doesn't want a slice of bread or a piece of bread. What does she want? She wants a whole loaf. Give me all of it, is the way this would be put. Or a thirsty man, not just for a glass of water, but a thirsty man, the implication being here, that he wants not a glass, but he wants the entire pitcher for himself. That's the kind of desire that's expressed in these words. The hunger and thirst in Matthew 5, 6 are for the entirety of the object. Now, the only thing that saves this language from our notion of gluttony, wanting the whole thing for ourselves, is in the nature of the object that's desired. 
For it's not food and water that's desired here. What's desired is righteousness. Jesus is saying, blessed are those who are passionate about what? All of the righteousness we can gather. Who are passionate about it all. What we know, what I realize in my own life, is that righteousness is not subject to a sort shortage for me. At the source, nor am I challenged to overconsume by some inner passion of mine. Now, it might be appropriate then, after describing what it means to hunger and thirst in the passage, to talk for just a minute about what righteousness means here. What are we passionate about here? What are we, what's Jesus speaking of when he talks about this hunger and thirst for righteousness? A lot of recent translations of the New Testament don't use righteousness in Matthew 5, 6, but they use other kind of words instead or phrases. They use justice, for example, for righteousness or for doing what is right. Now those phrases, those terms, those translations are easier on our eyes and in our ears than that word righteousness. After all, we stumble over that word When's the last time you were accused of being righteous? And I suspect if you were accused, you'd be embarrassed by it along the way. We stumble over that word. But any other word, I think, misinterprets or misuses what Jesus has to say here. They may be valid linguistic possibilities, but they really don't apply. They misrepresent the meaning that Jesus is trying to express here. For too often, what we think about in righteousness is some solely limited to ethical behavior, how we behave. I'm going to tell you righteousness does involve that. It involves ethics. It involves how we behave in life. But ethics is not the whole of what Jesus means by righteousness. And remember, Matthew 5, 6 concerns an object that's not desired in part, but desired. Remember what you want? You want what? The whole blessed thing is what you want. And it's more than that. The word is long and the word is used uncommonly in our language, but I think it's an appropriate translation of the text here. Righteousness, like other biblical words, has a variety of uses in both the Old and New Testaments. And it's applied to God and it's also applied to persons. As a description of God, especially in the Old Testament, It's a synonym or almost a synonym for holiness, God's holiness. The holy and righteous God, for example, is a recurring theme in the Psalms and in other books of the Old Testament. It's slightly different in that it does have specifically ethical overtones so that it can mean and sometimes means the justice of God. The righteous God is a just God, we say. For the righteous God is especially concerned with those in the margins of life, with the poor and the helpless and the destitute. And the scripture describes or compares the God of goodness with the evil of human ways, of our ignoring of the poor and the destitute and those on the margins. But at the same time, the righteous God is a God of strength contrasted with human weakness. It's more than that though, as I've said. The term for righteousness also means our relationship with God and with one another. It's sometimes used in the language about covenant, the covenant established between God and God's people. The steadfast God expects steadfast obedience from the people of the covenant. As applied to me as an individual, Righteousness is relational in that it compares my life to God's life. Remember what I've said about the Beatitudes? These are a description of those who will willingly follow after Jesus. If we live up to our calling, our high calling in Christ, these Beatitudes are descriptive of our behavior of our life in Christ. For our Lord is the very norm, the very standard for righteousness. It has strong implications for my life and for years. In various places in the New Testament, the Greek term is translated as doing what is right or rightness or just or justice. Matthew 5, 6, this commandment, this beatitude of Jesus 
can correctly be read as commending those who are passionate then for justice in the world or for what is right in their behavior. While accurate, that's not the whole of it. Given the fragility of words and the difficulty of understanding biblical righteousness, it can't be the whole. To identify in this beatitude righteousness as simply doing the right thing or being just is to run the risk of confining the meaning in ways that Jesus doesn't intend. This is not just about your personal morality when God says, when the Lord says, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Often, we can achieve that kind of thing, that justice, through social or political efforts. From other passages, it's clear to me that the author of Matthew understands righteousness as a condition that leads us to the Lord. Let me say that again. That righteousness is a condition that leads us to the foot of the throne of our Lord. Matthew often links righteousness with the kingdom of God or the reign of God. Righteousness originates not in us, but originates in God himself. God is making for a new and righteous relationship with him in Jesus Christ. It's only possible through Jesus. Ethics, morality come into play within that new relationship with God. I can only, the scripture argues, do the right thing by the Lord by committing myself to follow in the ways of Jesus, even the ways expressed here in the Beatitudes. It's then a truth, I think, that righteousness in this Beatitude is understood as our right relationship with the Lord in all of its dimensions, spiritual and ethical and moral. Righteousness includes justice, it includes right relationship, but it includes even more than that. For I think as I look at righteousness and how it's used here, it has a deep passion that's expressed. When I asked you earlier, what is your deep passion? In scripture, the deep passion, the hunger and righteousness, is not just to do the right thing or to be in the right relationship. The deep passion is a hunger for truth itself. The psalmist describes it in this way. Mercy and truth meet together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Passionate then for righteousness. Passion for righteousness means a willingness on my part, a willingness to take risk in making the church live up to its high calling and calling me to live up to my high calling in Jesus Christ to recognize the miracle that is Jesus, the mystery that is salvation, and the authority that is God's word for me, and a willingness to scrutinize who we are as the church by the norm of righteousness. Do we as a church have a passion for the truth that plays out in our desire for justice and mercy in the world is the question. Hunger and thirst for the way of the Lord is a willingness on your part and on my part to accept the freedom that God gives you to take a great leap of faith in following after Christ himself. Now let me close this with this understanding. Ultimately, righteousness is none other than Jesus Christ. Righteousness is none other than God's truth revealed in Jesus. Remember what it says in John's gospel when Jesus says what? I am the way and the, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by whom? But by me. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life is the, then the passion by which and for which we live. I told you before that my wife on Sundays, uh, she's there this morning, takes her father uh, to his little Baptist church in Crosby. And they go to Sunday school together and the Sunday school teacher in that classroom, his wife who is always there, the teacher's wife who's always there, um, has some form of dementia. I don't know if it's Alzheimer's, uh, but she has reached the point in her life where she can be disruptive. You all have run across this in your own lives. 
where those with dementia or Alzheimer's can be disruptive, or they simply say the same thing over and over, they forget what they've just said. Well, she's reached the point in her life that she no longer remembers her husband. Okay? He takes her to church, brings her along, but he, she doesn't know who he is and will challenge him even in the Sunday school class that he teaches. But he told the class not long ago, and well, I've came on talking about this, that he puts her in the car when she is at her worst, and he puts in a CD of old gospel songs. And while she cannot remember his name, she remembers every word of those old gospel hymns. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. I could go on and on with this. She knows them all as they're in the car. And it's soothing to him and to her. Now, as you can imagine, I'm, well, maybe you can't imagine, I'm not a huge fan of contemporary Christian music. I love our choir, which you can say amen, amen. I love our choir and what they do. And thank y'all for doing that today. I don't think I've ever had anything done in my honor. What, what a cool thing that is. Okay, so thank y'all. Um, but nonetheless, um, I, I love tra traditional music of the church. It's the stuff I grew up with, and I have it memorized. I think I have almost every first line of every hymn in our hymnal. I know it by heart. Okay. But there is a new song that's come out in recent years that I heard sung um, that's begun to haunt my memory. So that when I awake at 2.30 in the morning, and before I check the outdoors to see if the cars are there, and before I check the Astros score, I think about this song. It's written by a man named Danny Gokey, who later won um, American Idol. Okay? And he wrote a hymn that goes this way. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all the world, but give me Jesus. There's a second verse and a third verse, which I sing more and more these days. And when I come to die, oh, and when I come to die, and when I come to die, give me Jesus.